Oh. That's not heavy metal. You know? That's not the way we're going to do music. You know? That's has nothing to do with heavy metal. You know? If I'm not more able to do vocals in a live show, you know, it's gone, you know. The party's over, you know. But the business is getting bigger, you know. The stage is getting bigger. They put screens on a stage and putting this on a stage. And we just have our martial sex, you know. Maybe a big drum rush, have a good light show. That is it, you know. We are the main part of a metal show. And not the screens, whatever, you know. It's it's completely different, you know. But, um, yeah, that's what I thought before. That's our secret. We are still a real metal band, you know. Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocalist of Cryptopsy and the host of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast, brought to you by Sound, Talent, Media, and Evergreen Podcasts, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians, talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. This Vox and Hops episode is presented by Heavy Montreal. Heavy Montreal are Montreal's premier metal promoter, and they have a massive gig coming up this week. That's right, I'm talking about the Amana Marth Carcass Obituary and Cattle Decapitation Show which is taking place this Saturday at Place Bell. If you have not already, go grab your tickets. You can do that on their website, heavymontreal.com. I have put the link to that in the description of this podcast. I'm going to be there. It's going to be a banger of a show. So you should be there too. I am beyond stoked to have Heavy Montreal behind the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. Now, before we jump into today's episode, I would just like to ask you to follow the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast on the podcast platform of your choice. But more than that, I would love for you to tell a friend about the podcast to someone in your life that just loves old school metal. Well, you should let them know that the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast exists. You can tell them that there are over 380 episodes where I sit down with some of the world's best metal musicians we talk all about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer if you were to encourage one of your old school metal loving friends to become a brand new vox and hops head that would be something that i would truly appreciate now today on the podcast i'm very stoked to be joined by the legend tom angel ripper of sodom get ready everyone this is vox and hops episode number 382 I warn you, what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed. Hey, what's up, everyone? Today, I'm with Tom Angel Ripper of Sodom. Very, very stoked to be with you, Tom. Uh, You're a legend. Well, I, I love having chats with legends, and, you know, I know everyone says that to you, and you probably take it lightly, but it's absolutely true. And uh, it's very cool to hang out with you. Let's start with a very, very simple one. How are you doing? I am fine. I am fine. Yeah, so I had a lot of promotion activities around the new album, you know, a couple of interviews. So, and, uh, yes, but and that's my job, you know. I like to do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have read that um, music keeps you alive. Which is uh, something that you you've I've, in in some interviews you've mentioned that, so so doing promotion such as we're doing right now, having conversations with people from around the globe. I'm from Montreal. You're in Germany. Um, you got to promote the stuff, and this is a part of the job that keeps you alive. So that is a good thing. Yes, I think touring keeps me alive. You know, um, <laughs> when, when I get yes. when I get in contact with the fans, you know, and get get so much good reviews, you know, and uh, we always try to give the, the fans something back, you know. We always do some beat and greet after the show, you know. This is what I really, really helps, you know. And uh, we get so many good reactions, you know. You know, we just we just do the music for the for the fans, not for the record companies. And it's not about the money, it's not about the dollars, it's about the connections and the community and everything that you've built from starting out so long ago, over forty years now. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Crawling out of the coal mines with your bandmates. To, to forming a community, creating genres. We're going to build to that, but let's just start with the shittiest question I'm going to ask you. The question that we all typically start with nowadays, uh, how did you cope with the glorious years, plural, of 2020, 2021, half of 2022, and probably not the rest of 2022, I certainly hope not, and none of 2023? How have you been doing in these crazy times? Uh, we, we always have been active, you know. During these times, you know, we, get a, um, we booked a lot of shows, which get cancelled and uh, the, or postponed to the next year, you know. But we never mind, you know, we um, um, we have written a new album, you know. It's Genesis 19, you know. So we spent more time with the band in the rehearsal room, writing songs, being together with the band, you know. I know we had a lockdown in Germany here, you know, but I never mind. I fucked them, you know. We, I just, I have to do my <laughs> job, you know. Shows get cancelled, you know, and I get some offers doing some... Um, kind of digital shows which you can see on YouTube without any audience, you know. 
I don't want it, you know. That is, that is not the job I want to do, you know. Uh, that is not a heavy metal concert, you know. But we spent a lot of time writing songs, you know. That was the only positive, you know. In a financial way, we lost a lot of money, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we cancelled 20 or 30 shows, you know, which is a lot of money, you know. But shit happens, yeah. Shit happens, and you have to bounce back. And you guys definitely used the time creatively to write a new album, to put together this massive, greatest hell of Sodom, 40 years at war, which is what we're talking about right now. But before that, Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends and talking about their lives and music while sharing a craft beer. Now, before we started recording this, you mentioned that you've cut down your alcohol consumption yes. a lot over the past few years. Uh, so what are you going to be drinking today that we will be that we will be sharing virtually. I drink rose. What is it called? Rose hip tea. You know what it is? In, in German, it's called. I, I know exactly what it is. Yeah. In German, it's called Hagebutten. It's it's a small. It's from a rose, the berry. You know, and it's it's tea, and I drink mineral water. You know, I don't I don't I don't drink alcohol so much. You know, I just drink when we had a show, and after the show, I get some beers, some Jack Daniels. You know, and then it's then it's gone. You know. I remember years ago or decades ago, I was drunk every day, you know. That's too much, you know. Yeah. Um, every, but if you drink so much, you know, everything is getting out of control, you know. I have to do a new album, I have to do this, I have to do that, you know. It's a full-time job, you know, being a professional musician. So I reduced it massive. Uh, did it come to a point where it was too much of a party and you couldn't do the job properly and that's why you took the decision to cut down? I also read that. When when your bandmate Witch Hunter passed away, sadly, that's something that affected you a lot with your relationship with alcohol. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was an alcoholic during the whole times, you know. And when uh, when he left the band in '92, you know, he drank more. You know, that was he was he was drunk all the days, you know, every day. And when we recorded the final Son of Evil, you know, he was drunk all the time, so he was not able to play drums, you know. So you have to get a break, you know, we have to we have to try tomorrow, you know. And it was a really hard job recording the drums with him, you know. And a couple of years later he died, you know, in cause of alcohol, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I'm Uncle Tom, I drink alcohol. I'm I'm famous for drinking, I'm famous for smoking, you know. I can't quit, quit smoking, that's the next project, you know. But um <laughs> but I have so many things to do, you know, and, and I can't, you know. Mm -hmm. There, there are there are some horrible consequences with enjoying craft beer and beer and such, but I am going to drink a beer right now because it's oh, Vox and Hops. Yes. This is uh, my brand new collab with Sankem Bada. It's called Ossuary. Uh, the Philip Ivanovic uh, did a killer job with the design oh. of this crazy skull uh, Ossuary-inspired label here. Cheers. Cheers to you. Uh, this is um, an IPA that was brewed with Phantasm. Fast Phantasm is an extract of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon grapes from New Zealand. So it's like a grape must instead of hops. They use some hops, but very little amount of hops. I'm going to crack this, and I would love to take you way, way back before, I imagine before in the coal mines, when, after a hard day in the coal mines, your very, very first beer. Remember the first beer they ever drank, Tom? It was a beer from my father. My father was drink, uh, drank uh, Kronbacher. You heard about yeah, and that's uh, the, fir the first one I taste, you know. And Kronbacher was it's a great, still a great beer, you know. Uh, my favorite beer is Diebitz Alt. Okay, it's a kind of special brew. It's more dark, you know. But 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 anything you drink in Germany beer, it's it's clean, you know. Yes. And um, I remember three weeks ago we played a Mexico Metal Fest, you know. Yeah. We get some shit, you know. I don't know what it is, you know. You cannot compare it, you know. We always. You always get Heineken, you know, or get Beck's beer, you know, uh, which is awful, which I really don't like, you know. <laughs> and I always, when we look, when we come back from to Germany to Düsseldorf with a band after a trip from America, from whatever, you know, we first we do we drink a German beer mm -hmm. because this is and it's worldwide the best, you know. It's clean. There is no chemicals in it, you know, which we call in Germany Deutsches Reinheitsgebot, the law of purity. It's clean. There is it's nothing in just three. Uh, things, you know. Yeah, water, hops, and barley. Yes, 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 you are right. So that's the best one, you know. But when we play outside Germany, what can we do? You know, we try, we always try the local beers, and but it's... It should. <laughs> <laughs> you are 100% correct. And uh, Mexican beers tend to have a, be made with corn, a lot of it. And they do tend to try to give us 
Bex and Heineken when we're on tour because it seems more prestigious, but they're not better breweries. They just have better marketing campaigns. Yeah. And uh, having toured Germany and overindulged in many German pure beers in the past on tour with Cryptopsy, um, I wake up feeling much better. Way better. And cheers to clean German beers. Yes. With my teeth. I love it. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the soundtrack of your youth. Now, a lot of people know where you came from. Uh, I mentioned the coal mine a lot because when I read that, I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. Someone that basically crafted their own destiny, made a decision that they were going to change their life, and then did. But let's go back before that. Uh, when you were growing up in your parents' and guardians' house, what music was playing in the house when you were not in control of the radio? What music did your parents or guardians listen to? Oh, my parents listened to um, Schlager music, you know. Schlager, it's um, an, a traditional German Volksmusik. My father listened to Heino and Roberto Blanco. And it's called Schlager in Germany. And um, I hate it in this time. So my <laughs> older sister, my older sister listened to um, T-Rex and glam rock band uh, Slade and the Sweet, you know. And that's what I really enjoyed, you know, because. I heard the first time I heard electric guitars, you know, distortion guitars, you know, and um, I think that inspired me for being a music fan. Mm -hmm. And um, and my, I remember my first single I bought for my own money was uh, a band called um, um, Butterfly. Okay. And then the song is called Popcorn. Amazing. You, if if you listen, if you listen to the song, you know what I mean. It was the first single I bought, you know. And then I start, um, start recording tapes, you know, friends of mine got the first album and I start with Deep Purple. My first regular album was Rainbow Rising in 76. You know, that was the first record I bought. You know. Do you remember the first live music experience you went to go witness? Would it have been a Schlager band that your parents dragged you to? No, no, no. I, I, don't, have, I don't have some money in this time for, for concerts, you know. My first real metal or rock concert was ACDC. Really? In in 79, and they played in um, Essen, Gruger Halle. Yeah. Which is very, very, very famous. And they played with Judas Priest. Amazing. It's a support band, you know, with Bon Scott, you know. Yeah. I, I saw Bon Scott in, on, a, on a live show, you know. That was the first gig I ever saw, you know. And this is what I never forget, you know. What a wonderful band, you know. Both bands, you know, Judas Priest in these times, you know. The best. So you're recording and tape training with your friends, and then you go to the show. Uh, were you already in your in your mindset of I'm going to do this one day? I'm going to no. perform. Never, never. Because I never learned instrument, you know. Okay. <laughs> and um, I, I was very bad in school in the music, you know. Mm -hmm. I never, th I never thought about it. You know? I just want to, I just want to go to the concert, enjoying the concert with my friends, drinking some beers, you know. And from the time I saw more, had the first shows, you know, and, and when I get some money, you know, but it's, it was very cheap, you know, it was, I think it was 15 marks in these times, but 15 marks was a lot of money for me. Absolutely. When I went to school, you know, and, uh, but I never thought about making music for myself, you know, never. I have spoken to a lot of European musicians and the countries take schooling and music being very important together. It's not something that's crossed over to North America here. We don't have music class the way that you guys did. You mentioned that music wasn't something that worked for you when you were in schooling atmosphere. No, At what point no. did that change and you started doing it yourself? What was what was it about the schooling music that didn't grab you? Uh, we, we, we listened to classic music in school, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was I was never interested in classic music, you know. Nowadays I can hear listen to classic as well, you know. That is not a problem, you know. But in this time, my teacher he came up with, with an acoustic guitar, you know, and doing classic music, and that was I was never really interested in. That is not the music I want to do, or I I I I, I listen to, you know. And later uh, I came back to music. I can. I came back with the idea of making music in, I think it was in 80, 81, you know, when the first mm -hmm. Venom record came out. You know? Yeah. That was, that was a spark to the powder keg, you know. <laughs> this, this album, I was a big Motorhead fan. I saw all the Motorhead shows in Dortmund, in Essen, you know. And uh, when this album came out, everything changed. You know? Do you remember your first time on stage? Um, it was with Sodom. Really? Yeah, that was in, that was in 80, that was in 84, you know, there was, um, uh, there was a Venom fan club in Germany, in Frankfurt, 
you know. And um, they, they had a Venom signing session. And they also oh, really? want to have one or two bands as, as, uh, playing live there. And you know? we played with Tankard and Sodom, you know. Amazing. And there was a Venom signing session after the show, you know. And also the structure came to visit the show and we did a session on the stage, you know. That was not a really metal concert. It was just for this jam session, you know. Uh, and that was my first show, you know. I know. I remember. I was. We were really drunk, you know. <laughs> and I'm falling down on stage, you know. We were just. We just were able to play four or five songs, you know. And after four songs, we restarted with the first one. You know, yes. that was crazy. <laughs> there was also a tape around. Somebody recorded the show. Really? Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of. Them. That was my first show. Yeah. But to be, but to, but to, but to see my heroes in a signing set, you yeah. know, yeah, all as well. It was crazy, you know, Kronos and, and Abaddon, you know, it was amazing. You know, were they personable too? Were they were they friendly? No, no, they, they never heard about Solomon because in this, you know, we had a, um, we had just two demo tapes out. You know, they they are not really interested. I think they get. They get um, um, they come back later, you know, when the first Sodom record came out in in eighty five, you know, but they, they were not really interested, you know, because Venom was the biggest band in the world, you know. Absolutely. They never mind what what smaller bands did, you know. I was just wondering because you you mentioned that you the meet and greets and the fans is so important to you. I was wondering if that came from that experience with them is where I was headed on that. I also think it's interesting that destruction tanker you guys you guys are all labeled as like being the big four basically and that first show you guys were all together at from that starting point unbelievable that yes yes we are we're still good friends you know it's amazing I, and, and the mexico metal fest you know that was a big four you know there was a promoter who want to have all the big four bands you know playing on one stage you know mm -hmm. and there was tanker destruction creator that yeah. also played grave digger and Hellhammer, you know different other bands you know that was amazing. What people are asking me, why are you, you never touring with the big four, you know? It's complicated. Well, yeah, yeah, I know. It's very complicated, <laughs> you know. I always talk to Schmier, you know. I want, you know. Hmm. So we, we, we don't talk about a tour, you know. If we have a free we a weekend where we have no shows, no studio jobs, you know, we can do a show. We can book a show worldwide, you know. And this mm -hmm. package is good for 6,000 people, maybe more, you know. Absolutely. In my opinion, you know. But I think there is one musician who is not really interested in, you know. Ah, okay. I understand. You know, <laughs> because it's, it's a big one, you know. <laughs> but for the fans, you know, a dream club will come true, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the four bands. There is, you know, the, what is the big four? The big four thrash bands, you know. I think even Halloween or Running Wild are bigger than Sodom, you know. Mm. Or Tankard, you know. But people talking about the big four thrash metal bands, you know. When you guys started out, I read that you wanted to revolutionize music. It was something that, for you, that was important when you guys started playing. Yes, yeah, yeah. We, we, that was a revolution, definitely, because um, we we were against an, anybody, you know. We were against teachers, parents, establishment, politics, you know. We just want to make noise, you know. Yeah. When when we started with the first band, was which was uh, bloody months on the drums, you know, and um, aggressive on the guitars, you know. We we want okay. We want to form a band. Okay, what you gonna play? You know, I don't know. I never played an <laughs> instrument. You know, and I I try the first. I try playing drums in the beginning. You know, really, I, that's interesting. It's not it's not a job for me. You know, Frank has already some guitar riffs. You know, so what was left? The bass bass guitar and the vocals. You know, <laughs> but we never we we never imagined that we we've been get a record deal or being. That the band is still alive after 40 years, you know. We're just being in our small, dark rehearsal room making noise, you know. And the people hate us, you know. At this time, you know, this heavy metal was not so popular, or even especially this music we did, you know. I remember my, my best friend in school, he listened to a band called Element the Ends. It's kind of glam rock, I don't know, I had, and I was the only one with a motorhead patches on my jacket, you know. Yes. <laughs> and people, they, they, people they hate it, you know. I was a desperado, you know. But they, this kind of music was not popular. I think more ACDC, Priest, Saxon, they were really popular, but not this kind of music we did, you know, which we called Witching Metal in the beginning, you know. You know, we, we never thought about making money with this music, you know, or going on tour or whatever, or make, uh, re recording albums, you know. <laughs> Just making noise, you know, and that was the first tapes, uh, demo tapes, Witching Metal and Victim of Death, you know. You were doing it for yourselves, basically. 
just for me, just for herself, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, then we started sending the 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 tapes to America. We sent tapes to worldwide to the magazines because the magazines were really interested. I I know there was was a magazine uh, from America called Kick S. That was the first metal magazine in U.S. America, you know. And we got wonderful reviews, the heaviest band in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. And that started with a song, Sodom is heavier than um, Venom and faster than Metallica. You know? What a quote. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> quote, yeah. <laughs> uh, but we never mind, you know, but we got the first record deal in, in 84, you know. Sodom was the first band we got a deal. You know? mm-hmm. I don't know why. Uh, but the, uh, Manfred Schutz was a label chief. And he said, this band is really, it's, a, it's the worst band in the world. But there is some magic. There is some special into the music, you know. So let's try, you know. We don't want to record an album just recording five songs in EP and bring it out. We'll see what happens, you know. Interesting. So that they, they took a gamble on you, but not a big gamble on you because it was only five songs, yeah. Yes, yeah, because they don't, they don't want to spend they don't want to spend so much money for it, you know. Exactly. The producer, exactly. The producer Horst Müller, was not really interested. <laughs> he didn't help us, you know. And he kept the studio, he told us, just recording the shit, go home. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was Horst Müller, you know. <laughs> But not, but when I'm looking back, you know, to Inner Son of You, you know, it's it's amazing. People love it, you know. It's it, I know it's chaotic, you know, it's it's out of tuning, it's out of timing sometimes, you know. But there is some magic, there is some some spirit into the music, you know. When we re-recorded the songs, you know, that was really hard because um there were a couple of songs on Obsessed by Cruelty we never recorded, we never played live, whatever, you know. Yeah. Did you forget what they were? Did you forget the riffs and you couldn't really make them out? I forgot the riffs. Yeah, I exactly. couldn't even hear the riffs. What, what exactly. We, what we or <laughs> and I told to the drummer, my drummer is a really witch, big Witch Hunter fan, you know. He liked Witch Hunter's drumming because it's so characteristic, you know. It's chaotic but characteristic. And he tried to record the song. We tried to do it in a more accurate way, you know. Mm-hmm. Tuning the guitars, playing timing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but we keep, but we kept the spirit of of these songs, you know. That's exactly what I was going to ask you about. Obviously, forty years at war, the greatest hell of Sodom. You went, and you took a track from each of your albums over the forty year span of your career to re-record them. So that's exactly what we're talking about right there. So going back and relearning stuff that you hadn't played in probably forty years, uh, stuff that you probably recorded maybe a little bit too inebriated um, to even get it across straight. Uh, it must have been a challenge. And uh, choosing songs, I also read that you chose, you didn't want to just do the hits. You wanted to do something eclectic, something that would build towards a future set list too. So very cool idea to to tackle some. It was a big, it's a mammoth project to do. Yeah, people, yeah, the, the most people expect Agent Orange from Agent Orange, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, what we, we, you know, we spent so much time. We we listened to to the whole albums, you know, to, to every song you know, with the whole band, you know. And this is a good song. This could be a good. It's a typical solemn song, you know. Okay, let's let's take this song, you know, and um, you know. But this really helps us, you know, for for the next upcoming set list, you know, when we put, you know, solemn is a band. We want to change the set list from show to show, you know. And uh, that's this that's really helps us, you know, because we don't want to play the same set list over years, like other bands do, you know. And uh, now we we are able to do Equinox from Obsessed by Cruelty, you know. We recorded Equinox, um, but later the guitarist died who played the song after mm-hmm. the Delia. You know? Yeah. So we, we, we changed this and wanna give him a tribute and recording after the Delia, you know. But um the song Equinox is still there, you know, it's still, it's on tape. It's a bonus track, you know. <laughs> I got this, the whole package here for promotion. You know. <laughs> no, no, what, that was really important to to record some underrated songs, you know, songs we never played, you know. Yeah. That was really interesting. That was a, that was also a project to do this, you know, songs mm-hmm. we never recorded, you know, that was really interesting, you know. How did it feel going back and singing lyrics that you'd written so long ago? D- d- was it easy to to dance back into the same mindset? I even had problems to find the lyrics. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I go- did you have to but go I, listen, I Googled, you know, listen to have, it and like? <laughs> we have all the. I think we have all the lyrics on our homepage, so so I can copy it and and, and print, print it out, you know. <laughs> Yeah, and you know there are you know there are so many songs you know there are so many I can 
I couldn't remember all the lyrics. No, of course not, no. <laughs> but but then we started a jam session recording, uh, uh, rehearsing the song before we recorded it. You know, it needs a long, it, it stays, you know. And what is the tuning? What is the timing? How fast is the song? How, where's, what is the break here? Who played the guitar solos, you know? Um, so York played some, Frank played some, you know. And it was really funny to do, you know. It's very, very interesting. I think it's a very cool approach. But in, but I have to tell you, in, in, originally we planned to do a live album, you know. But we thought before we, all the shows got cancelled. We, 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 we couldn't find a proper show with all the equipment recording a live album, you know. That's what my dream is, you know, the next uh, recording a live album. You know? why, why is that so important to you versus a studio one? Yeah, because we, we when uh, if you're looking back, you know, when we recorded four studio albums, you always released a live album. You know? Okay. And um, then we had, we had two record, we had some DVDs, lots of the Primitive One and Two, you know, and then came the other album that kind of came a lineup change, you know. I want to have a live album, you know. Uh, but I, I want to record a live album not playing in Wacken or bigger festival where the people are waiting for the headlining band, you know. I, want, I need to find some special places recording a live album, you know. Something that's important to you and to Sodom would make sense. Yes. You know, when we recorded One on in Bangkok, you know, we want to... We, Amazing. We, we want to record this in Vietnam, you know. That was yes. impossible in this time, yeah. you know. We, we get some contacts from a music magazine. Or go, he want to help us, you know. But then they got to the the, the politics, the, the local one in Ho Chi Minh City, Zagonia, they got the lyrics from Marines, which mm. is on M16, you know. And they said, we are pro, pro-American, you know. Mm. So we don't know, we don't have any Western bands playing here, you know. You know, that was the first idea for the, for, for the advisory, you know. And then the second idea was making a sample just like the Tembeck years, you know putting some existing material together, do a remaster, whatever, you know, that is not, that is not a special thing for the fans. No, if a no. song fan, you, you know this, you know. And then I came up with the idea of re-recording the songs, you know. It's interesting. With the, and then it must have been a challenge for the new lineup, too, to go back and revisit these classic songs. I know for myself, I just did that for a Cryptopsy song, and it, it was a challenge to dig into Lord Worms. Um, shoes and mentality and try to nail it but also have my own characteristics on it yeah but i think this project helps us you know for the set list absolutely and to, to also for the younger band members to understand what the meaning behind song exactly you know, learning more from the historical things you know and, and yeah that helps, really helps us you know i read that you guys still jam twice a week is that is that true yeah yeah unbelievable tom yeah we're gonna the next rehearse tomorrow Amazing. Sunday, you know. I know that other bands don't never rehearse. No one know? does that. <laughs> no one. <laughs> no one. Almost no one, especially in the modern age with the digital world there. But <laughs> I, I think it's amazing, and it's why you guys work. I, I, I hate it, you know. Yeah, well, okay, when you know, the uh, guitarist living in America, the yeah. drummer's living in England, you know, how you can rehearse, you know. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they got to write the songs by MP3 trading, sending mm-hmm. files, you know. That is not the way, you know. When my guitarists have a good idea for guitar, he's gonna record it at home, send send to us, you know. But after that, we go to the rehearsal room and making the jam session, you know. We have to arrange the songs together, you know. And um, I know that it's a, it's an old school way, you know. But I enjoy it every minute. Uh, Sometimes we just drink a beer, talking, go home, you know. What's well, good for the, the the business side of the band too to be so connected that way? It works, you know. I think that is the secret why we are still alive, you know, mm-hmm. because we are a band, you know. Um, we have different ways to record an album, recording songs, you know. And I know that people, that when, when they're recording songs, they use digital profiling amps, you know, like Camper and all this yep. stuff, you know. I hate all the <laughs> shit, you know. And, and Frank is also old school like me, you know. He took his Marshall, which is 50 years old, maybe older, you know. Putting a microphone on a speaker, recording the guitars, you know. And this is the same we're gonna do with the drums, you know. We have no trigger signals for recording. If you have a trigger signal, you can change the bass drums or the oh, snare, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. I want to have the snare lo- like it sounds in a rehearsal room, you know. And uh, I, I know that is old school, but it's, I think that is a secret, you know. That that we are, that, that 
that we never changed anything, you know. You never conceded. You never sold out. You never, during the 90s, you guys stuck and even just got heavier. You, you, you didn't go the route that a lot of other bands were doing at the time. And I think the secret is that it's it's just you guys. It's and it's a part of your identity. You are the identity of, of Sodom. And jamming and being together and rehearsing is a big part of that. So I, I commend you for that. I think it's I think it's fucking awesome, honestly. It never changed the music, you know. I know that a lot of, a lot of bands in the 90s, they would change. Even, even my favorite band Slayer, they changed a little yeah. bit in the 90s. <laughs> I like every Slayer and that sort of thing, you know. But um, in these times, you know, we, we, we have written the, he the heaviest solo albums ever. You know, if yes. you start with Tapping the Way, Get What You Deserve, Masquerade in Blood, you know. Yeah. Which album is heavier than, than that, you know? <laughs> um, I think a lot of bands are too gripped with, in the music industry, you know, with the record companies and, and the management, you know. We never, you know. The record company, they're going to bring it all. They're going to do the promotion. You know? We're going to do the music, you know. And I talk to my record company with the next album, for example. When we get the master finished, you get it. And you bring it out or, or not, you know. I'll find we never someone talk else about, I never <laughs> talk about with the record company what to do, you know. Amazing. Being heavier, doing more this, doing more black metal, doing more death metal. Doing... We never mind. We do what we want, you know. That is the secret. I like that very much. I like that very, very much. Um, I would like to know about... Um... There's like this whole thing happening in death metal with Cryptopsy. I'm very tied to the death metal scene. There are a bunch of young bands that are doing like old school style death metal bands such as Undeath, uh, Sango Sugabob, 200 Stab Wounds, and they sound like old productions, but they're bringing it back in 2020. Uh, what is your opinion on bands that are trying to recreate things that were popular in the 80s, let's say? You can't. It's very simple. You can't, you know. I know a lot of bands. It's a good band. Uh, it's called Traitor in Germany. I like this band, you know. And they're wearing the same clothes, you know, with with, with, with Adidas boots and all the stuff, you know. They were, I think they were more like Exodus, a little bit like Testament, a little bit like Sodom in it, you know. Yes, but I, I always get in contact to younger bands uh, to ask me what to do, you know, get more famous, you know. Do something different, you know. That is, It's very hard nowadays because... You know, in Germany or Europe, hundreds of bands coming out every month. You know? Absolutely. If I get a Rock Hut magazine or Metal Hammer, there are 200 or 300 newcomer bands coming to the scene, you know. It's really hard now to try to create something new, you know. Try to find a singer who is outstanding from all the others, you know. That is the only thing. Ne never give up anything. You know? Never give up your school, studio, your job, whatever, you know. Somebody uh, last week, a young guy asked me, he want to quit school to make music, to get a rock star, you know. I said, no way, make school, you know, and, and try to find a job, you know. Um, it's The business is really, it's getting harder, you know. The contracts you're going to sign, you know, you have to take care of what you sign. You know? we, we, when we are looking back, you know, our first contract, we just sign it, you know. Just for, <laughs> just for, we got a case of beer, you know. <laughs> and there was 100 pages we signed on the last one. It's okay. It's like, but nowadays, you have to really take care of it, you know, of contracts and business and management, promotion, merchandising, publishing, and all this stuff, you know. They take it all now. It's not like back in the day. And, that, and labels aren't going to build bands really nowadays. They, they want sure bets of things that are just going to make their return. It's a big difference from the 80s there. Yeah, sometimes it seems, seems like the band are casted, you know. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Some band, I don't want to talk about any band names no, no, I understand. in the interview, you know, but there are a couple of bands who think, what is it, you know, is it a band, you know. Some bands, even then, they, never, they, they, they don't play live in a show, you know. Mm -hmm. That is true. You know what I mean? I have a, um, a good friend of mine, he's mixing bands on, on live festivals, you know, it's like this band, you know. It's it's not live. It's all fake. Because the vocals <laughs> sound the same every show. You, you, that is um, unbelievable, you know. And uh, that is not that is not heavy metal. You know? That's not the way we're gonna do music. You know, that is, has nothing to do with heavy metal. You know, if I am not more able to do vocals in a live show, you know, it's gone. You know, the party is over. You know. But it, that, it's a, but the business it's getting bigger, you know. The stage is getting bigger. They put screens on a stage and putting this on a stage, and 
we just have our martial sex, you know, maybe a big drum rush, have a good light show. That is it, you know. We are the main part of a metal show. Mm-hmm. And not the screens, whatever, you know. It's it's completely different, you know, but um yeah, that's what I thought before. That's our secret. We are still a real metal band, you know. Mm-hmm. Playing live. Real musicians. Masters of their craft. I, I read an amazing quote from another interview that you did that one day you want to be ready to to take away the bass and go home to your wife. When you know that you can't do it anymore, you want to hang up your bass and you want to go and spend your life at home. You don't want to be basically R.I.P. to Lemmy. You don't want to go through what he went through where no, you're no, spending no, your no, last no. few days on stage when you could be spending it at home. Well, what is your mentality with that? Like when you can't do it anymore and hang up your bass? I think what, what I like when, when I saw Tom Arias last show at YouTube, you know, and he was, he was it's a couple of years ago, he was 56, 57, something like this, you know. And he said in an interview, okay, well, I'm, I'm touring all the time, you know. I never spent time with my family. Yeah, I couldn't spend time with my old friends, you know. I never see my kiddies growing up, you know. And um, so he said, I, I decided to do the last show now, you know. And, and then it's on YouTube, you know. He, he, that was the last note he played on the bass, you know. And then he went to the microphone and said to the audience, goodbye. I go, I go home. The wife was waiting in the backstage, you know. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's the way it is, you know, in my opinion. No? I don't want to wait until you get sick, you know, or you are not more creative, you're not more healthy enough to do this, you know. So I know sometimes the party is over, you know, and I'm, then I want to quit it from one day to another, you know. Mm-hmm. But Lemmy was completely different, you know. Mod had the crew and everybody was like a family, you know. Absolutely. And you know, when I quit my job, you know, all the people, all the other people lose their job as well, you know. And there is so much money behind, you know. When I cancel shows, you know, they lose a lot of money, you know. I never mind what others do, you know. It's my life, you know. Mm-hmm. But I never think about retiring nowadays, you know. I think I'm still able to do this, you know. Maybe five years, maybe ten years. I don't know. Well, when you started out, you guys were doing it for yourselves. You get your deal in 84. You never imagined that would happen. You never imagined you'd be doing it for 40 more years. So so there's no reason to put any more than just doing it for yourself as you used to. And as long as you're having fun and you feel like you can keep doing it, I think that's what you should be doing. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I, I, I love this job, you know. Um, I love being on tour, you know. I have so many other things to do, you know. I have so many hobbies, what I can do, you know. I know that a couple of other musicians, you know, when, when they came back from tour, sitting at home, they get depressed, they get depression, you know. What can, I want to I go back on stage, you know. I have so many things to do, you know. I think solo and the music is the biggest part of my life. It's not only to make money, you know. That's mm-hmm. not true, you know. I never get rich with this kind of music, you know. No, I can, no, no. I can make hard, money yeah. from my music, you know. I can. That is what I, I want to do, you know. But when I stop doing the music, and I have enough money, I, I, I take my hobbies, you know. I, I go hunting. I'm gonna drive more. I drive motorcycle, you know. Amazing. I have so many things to do, you know. Because I'm, I'm not, I'm not so in, gripped by everything, you know. I love music. I love touring, you know, but I also love being home. You know? It seems like you haven't been like roped in and like caught up with the whole industry side of things. And I think that's really amazing and inspiring that you love the music, you understand the business, but you haven't gotten trapped in it. Yes. We, I mean, we never get trapped. You know, I, I get my contracts. I'm going to sign the contract, you know, I, put, I make an album, you know, whatever they want, you know, but I am able to say, no, I stop here, you know. I never get a contract for 10 years. I never would sign a record contract for 10 albums yeah. for the next year. So yeah. I never. And um, I know that the party is over one day. I said, okay, no, that's, I'm, I'm gone. You know, it's, I'm finished. You know? I have a good relationship to my record company. We talk about everything, you know. You know, we're releasing an album. The next album, okay, we start writing songs, you know. And uh, then we have to get an option for the next record, for the next studio album, you know. It's very easy, you know. I work with SPV for all the times, you know. And we are we are friends. We can talk. It's not just a business, you know. 
when I talk to my promoter at SPV, he's like a friend. You know? I know they want to they wanna make money with the music, you know, I know. <laughs> um, um, but they have to, have to take care of what I think about it, you know, when, when recording an album, when releasing an album, you know. SPV has done a good thing, 40 Years at War, the greatest hell of Sodom. Tom, I have one last question for you, a classic Vox and Hops wrap-up question. It probably doesn't happen to you anymore because you're cutting back on drinking, uh, taking care of yourself a little bit better um, than you used to, but back in the day, it most definitely happened. Uh, what is your hangover cure? Oh, my God. You know, nowadays, when I get drunk, and I'm not, you know, what the last years, I never get really drunk, you know. But when I'm waking up in the morning, I don't. I need, I need days to retire. I need to come back, you know. <laughs> and um, I try to get good food, you know. Mm -hmm. That's very important, you know. And, um, and it's it's really it's really hard, you know. When I was younger, you know, I could drink every day, you know, without any problems, you know. Even when I was working in a coal mine, I was drunk every day, you know. Because in the coal mine, everyone was drunk. Which is super you know? dangerous. In, in the coal mine, I learned, I learned drinking. I, we drank more than, than the music business, you know. You know, I take, I take a pill or whatever, you know. I don't know. I, I, I'm just lying in bed, you know. It's sometimes, you know, when we, when we wake up on Friday, had a drink in the night, you know. We we just start drinking on Saturday, you know. We drink all the weekend, you know. That is the best way you can do, you know. But um, but there is no special what I do. I just try to sleep and have some good food, you know, <laughs> some coffee. <laughs> you know what I told before? I want to. I don't want to quit drinking and all, but I have to reduce it. You know that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I can tell them, don't drink or don't take drugs, please, you know. No, no. And, and be in control, people. Uh, you I, you know, you got a lot to do. You're busy. Uh, you're doing a lot of promotion. You're, your music is your life, but you're balanced because you also have an amazing home life. Tom, you're, you're awesome. I, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, everyone, please go check out 40 Years at War, The Greatest Hell of Sodom. Just dropped SPV. Uh, it's a banger. It's Of course it's a banger. It's a collection of all the craziest songs from 40 years of music from Sodom. Well, waiting for the next album, and I can tell you what, you know, we, we, we got three songs finished. Amazing. And, yes, and I can tell you, this will be the heaviest Sodom album ever, you know. Fucking yes. What, what I want to do is, uh, we need a better production, you know? what I want to do is with the next album, recording this album in a big professional studio, you know, with a mixing desk and all the other um, analog equipment, you know, and I want to get Harris Jones back, you know. Harris Jones was like a fourth band member in the 80s, you know. And that was a big step when Harris started producing Sodom albums, you know. And I met him last year. We talked about recording albums, you know, and producing albums, you know. And he's really interested in bringing back engineering or doing a kind of co-production, you know. And why not? I gotta, And then we want to go to studio to Berlin. Um, it's my dream. It's my plan. You know, somebody has to pay it. You know, SPV. Let's go. But Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to spend the whole time with a band in a studio in Berlin. Yes. Maybe three weeks or four weeks. How long it needs? Sometimes you know, and and working in intense. You know, make, drinking some beers in the evening. You know, working on the, on the album. You know, and I think the next solo album will be the heaviest and the best produced solo album ever. I'm excited for that, Tom. Thank you so, so much for hanging with me, talking about life, music, a little bit about beer, but that's okay. Um, I had a great time. Massive cheers to you. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. This has been great. Cheers. Cheers, man. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right today. You know that I love and appreciate that. Man, this was an awesome conversation. I was just blown away at how candid, laid back, honest, and open Tom was about everything throughout his 40-year career. I can't believe that they still jam multiple times a week unbelievably blown away by the work ethic, by how important music is to his life energy and how he hasn't let the industry overwhelm him and take over his life. He still has a balanced home life. It's just amazing. So inspiring. If you haven't already, go check out the 40 years at war, the greatest hell of Sodom. What a cool way to honor 40 years of material to go back and re-record them, revisit them, re-experience them. 
freaking awesome. I think it's just so goddamn cool. Massive cheers to Tom for hanging out with me. I had an absolute blast, and I hope that you did as well. Now, if you enjoyed this Vox and Hops episode, you should sign up to the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast mailing list. You can do that on my website, voxandhops.com. That's V-O-X-A-N-D-H-O-P-S.com. And when you do that, you shall receive one email a month that will contain all of the details of everything that has been happening recently in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. You will get to see which episodes I dropped recently. You will get to see which episodes I have coming up. You will also get to see which albums the Vox and Hops album review crew have reviewed recently. You also get to hear about any projects that I have in the works before I announce them to the public. And trust me, I always have a lot of stuff going on. You will also get to see which albums Jerry Monk, Vox and Hops' Metal Architect, has added to the Brutal Awakenings playlist, which is available on both Apple Music and Spotify. Trust me, if you're looking for any new music to listen to, well, check out the Brutal Awakenings playlist. Jerry just has an ear for brand new music. He has his finger on the pulse of what's going on in the world of metal. Trust me, you will not be disappointed. You will definitely find an album that you will cherish forever. There's just so much going on in the world of the Vox and Hops Metal Podcast. I'd hate for you to miss a single thing, so sign up to the mailing list. The Vox and Hops Metal Podcast is brought to you by Sound, Talent, Media, and Evergreen Podcasts. I hope you have a killer rest of the week. I will be back next week with two episodes, one on Tuesday and another on Friday. But I have to tell you that these will be the final episodes for 2022. I am going to be taking a one month break and i will be returning with brand new vox and hops episodes on january 10th but until then remember to enjoy life metal and craft beer cheers vox and hops heads